<laughs> Blame it on your agent. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, we're live now with none other than Olympian, former AWA superstar, former WWE superstar, former roommate of Ric Flair, the man, the myth, the legend, none other than Ken Patira, one of the favorite guests of this show. How you doing? That, that, Good. I, I, I like that. One of the favorite guests. You are. Have you have you ever heard of the UFC fighter called Tank Abbott? Yeah, yeah. He's a big fan of yours. Yeah, I think I've met Tank. Did he say that we've met? No, he said that he watched your other interviews and he loved them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. I like Tank. Yeah, he he really likes you. Um yeah. Did you happen to catch Ric Flair's uh, last match the other night? No, I didn't. I, uh, a, a good mutual friend of ours called me a couple days later and asked me the same thing. I said no. And he says, well, it wasn't very impressive. <laughs> I said, hey, the, the, his friend's name was Kenny. I said, Kenny. He's 73 years old, for Christ's sakes. But what were you expecting? <laughs> he says, ah, I guess you're right. <laughs> Do you think that will really be his last match? Uh, I don't know. It, it all depends on how, how he feels uh, physically. You know, if, if, if he's uh, able, able to... Uh, lace his uh, boots up in the morning. I'm sure he'll have another one. I get. I guess I was real successful. Yeah, I heard almost uh, seven thousand fans legitimate in there, which is great. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the ticket prices were, but I heard that the gate was over half a million. Yeah, I heard it was somewhere around there, so that's pretty impressive. Yeah, very impressive. When was think, your last match? Do you recall? Uh, Jesus. No. I think it was against Wild Bill Irwin. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, Wild Bill. Uh, we had, uh, uh, God, somewhere in Minnesota, you know, I, 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 I had a small promotion there. Uh, which I ran off and on for about eight years. And, uh, but you know, Minnesota is a small state. So you and never so, had like an official retirement match. That was just happened to be your last match. Yeah. It'd be about 90 in 1999, 98, something like that. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Yeah, I did an interview with Bill Irwin last year, and he was f so drunk, he was, like, falling <laughs> asleep trying to answer the questions. Yeah, that's and, Bill. Yeah. yeah, the goon. He didn't last the hour. It, it stopped after about 35 minutes because he was passing out. Really? Huh. Yeah, he's he's not doing too well these days, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. I haven't seen Bill in, oh, God, I can't even remember now. Ten years? Okay. Yeah, about ten years. Well, Still he did a good advertisement there for now. why people should book him. Huh? He did a good advertisement with me for why people should book him. Oh. By, like, showing up so wasted he couldn't even answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I'm sure his wife would like to get him out of Duluth, Minnesota a few times a year. Yeah, that's, uh, well, he grew up there. You know, he, him and his brother. And uh, they were the talk of the town up there. Yeah, it's up on the, what they uh, call the, uh, what the hell do they call that? Uh, well, it's Duluth, uh, up on the Iron Range. Okay. Yeah, they discovered huge iron ore reserves up there uh, back in the day. And I think uh, 
uh, Henry Ford, when he started his car company up in Detroit, they used to send these big uh, steamboats into Duluth Harbor and uh, load up. You know, they're still doing it. That fucking thing, that goddamn iron ore will never run out. I, I, I remember 40, 50 years ago, there was, oh, God, we're going to be out of iron ore. We won't make, won't be able to make steel anymore. What a crock of shit. It's like the, it's like the oil companies. The oil company said, yeah, 50 years ago, we have peak oil. We only have five more years worth of reserves. This is like 1970. I said, what a bunch of bullshit. But anyway, that, 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 that's how the world works, you know. Tell everybody that we're, uh, we have no inventory or the inventory is low on everything, you know. Then they can jack the prices up through the roof, just like they're doing now. Yeah. Have, the, uh, have the riots and everything uh, stopped in Minnesota? No. No? It's no. Not. As a matter of fact, I, I moved out of uh, the Minneapolis area where all that shit went down. It, all that stuff that, uh, what the hell was it? George Floyd. George Floyd. What a fucking piece of work he was. He had fentanyl in his uh, system. When the cops put it, originally put him uh, under arrest and put him in the back of the squad car, he had three fentanyl pills in his hand. And when they put him in the back seat, they fell out of his hand. He was so fucked up, he couldn't sit up. And so uh, uh, I guess one of the officers forgot to uh, uh, lock the passenger door. So he rolled out and he was hanging out, you know, trying to get away. I don't know where he's planning on going, you know. <laughs> but I mean, the, the guy was drunk. I, I can't remember what time I was. Was that nine o'clock in the morning? And uh, he was causing a disturbance. And uh, he was uh, uh, selling $20 bills out of his front seat. He had a whole stack of $20 bills uh, you know, counterfeit, of course. And he was selling them uh, out of his uh, car window when the cops pulled up. And uh, but one of the officers, they look in the front seat, and here's a stack of 20s. And uh, I, th I can't remember exactly what the officer said, but he asked him, what, uh, why he had all that money in the front seat. And uh, he couldn't give them an an answer, so they checked them out there, uh, you know, counterfeit. So anyway, and they made a martyr out of him. You know, Black Lives Matter. That's another hoax piece of shit organization. Uh, the lady that uh, runs it, she bought uh, three or four houses. Uh, you know, all, all of them were close to a million dollars or over a million dollars. And then, uh, you know, the people that was expecting it never got a dime. That's true. Yeah. So they, I think they fired her. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah. There, there's a fan on here. Uh, someone wrote, keep slamming them, Ken. And, and someone else says, are you ever going to write an autobiography? I hired a guy four years ago. And he's still fucking around with it. And, uh, well, some of it's my fault because about a year and a half, two years ago, I got so despondent about uh, the progress he was making. And then I find out he had never written a book before. And but he, he came very highly uh, uh, rated. 
And I don't know how they rated him because he had never written anything before. And uh, so I don't know. I'm I, I'm just pissed off now. You know, I'm, I'm going to be 80 years old next year. You know, what the fuck? Who's going to want to read uh, a, a book uh, about old people? <laughs> I'm sure it would be very entertaining. <laughs> Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> if I was writing it, it'd be entertaining. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but the last time I interviewed you, I asked you about Billy Jack Haynes, and uh, you said that uh, you didn't necessarily like him, and I guess he saw that clip, and he said he thinks you were just ribbing him, and he wanted me to say yeah. hi well, I, to you. I like Billy. He just took it the wrong way, probably. Yeah, a uh, couple years ago, uh, when we were suing the WWE uh, for that brain uh, injuries and stuff, uh, but Billy's the one that contacted me to get me involved in it. And uh, I told him, I said, Billy, I, I said, I. It sounds good, but Vince has all the money. You can't fight City Hall. So it, eventually it just got dropped or thrown out, you know. But. Uh, and he's a guy that has legitimate concussion issues. You can tell talking to him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's the reason why you're not in the Hall of Fame because you were involved with that lawsuit? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it was uh, when I retired, I told Vince to go fuck himself so many times that, uh, but you know, Captain Lou Albano told him and his old man to go fuck their themselves call them I, irish motherfuckers irish cocksuckers and everything else and he's in the hall of fame so i i don't know yeah because you're you were an olympian and you have huge accomplishments one of the greatest heels ever. You're a very underrated heel and i i heard Don Morocco on some podcast talking with someone saying you weren't the best interview when you were a baby face, but that's because you're a natural heel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a bad man. <laughs> you know, I, uh, a few other things. Um, I hated being a baby face. I couldn't stand being a baby face. And, uh, but anyway, you know, being the Olympic Games and the All-American boy and, you know, when I started in the business, Vern Gagne wanted me to go one way and a few other promoters wanted me to, you know, do what Vern said because Vern knew what was best and everything. And, you know, when I started, you know, I, I didn't know anything about the wrestling business. And then I, after a couple of years, I realized it was all politics, you know, it had nothing to do with, well, had a little bit to do with your ability in the ring, but uh, it, it, it mostly how, how you were on the mic. If you could cut a good interview, you're in. I, I, I never knew that. You know, nobody ever told me. And you just you just don't pick that stuff up out of the air. You have to understand the politics. But if no nobody's telling you uh, the politics and giving you guidance, you know, it, it takes longer to find out. It took me two, I don't know, two to four or five years maybe to figure it out. So did you like the having to shake everybody's hand every night, even if you're on tour seven days a week? Did you ever, uh, some wrestlers don't like that. Uh, I was indifferent about it. You know, I, 
I could give a shit, you know, you know, shake somebody's hand and tell them to go fuck themselves behind their back. I guess that's the best way to do that. Yeah, that is, that's what bothers me about it. It's all yeah. fake. Yeah, so anyway. There's a uh, fan that, on here that uh, wants to know if you ever competed against Bill Kazmaier. In weightlifting? Yes. No, uh, we're in two different sports. We use the same equipment, the barbell, but uh, he was a power lifter. And I was an Olympic lifter. For those that don't know the difference, uh, Olympic lifting are the three lifts that you, you have to pick up off the ground and put over your head. You know, the press, snatch, and clean and jerk. And power lifting uh, is bench press, deadlift, and squat, which are, uh, we refer to them as partial lifts. And, uh, you know, like a bench press, you lay down on the bench. Uh, a deadlift, you just pull it up to your knees. And uh, a squat, of course, you take off a squat rack and squ squat down and stand up with the, you know, where the Olympic lifts, the military press goes overhead, the two hand snatch goes overhead, and the clean and jerk goes overhead. Yeah, so that's that's the difference. What were yeah. your all time best lifts? Huh? What were your all time best lifts in those three? In the Olympic lifts? Yes. Well, if you want to throw in the um, uh, training lifts and stuff, I had so many injuries over, I, you know, I only competed for three and a half years uh, before the Olympics. And of course, I would go to the Olympics. I'd, I had knee surgery a few months before the Olympics because I, I couldn't afford to get uh, knee surgery uh, any sooner. Yeah, we, we, were, we were true amateur athletes. We had no money. And if the fucking assholes uh, in the Olympic console found out you accepted money, it didn't matter if it was five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. If you had accepted 10 cents, even for training, they they kick you off the team. They won't let you compete. That's how strict they were. Yeah, we're amateur athletes in America. You know, we don't care what the Russians and the Germans and all the other people in the world think, you know, but we're true amateurs, you know, we're going to stick to it. And uh, it was a uh, backward uh, uh, thinking as far as I was concerned, but my lifts, my uh, military press, I, uh, I had 552 and uh, I snatched uh, four, 412, I think. And then the clean and jerk, I, I did a push jerk with, uh, uh, oh God, I don't know, 550, you know. But uh, nobody was even close to that, to any of those. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I was ahead of everybody. But then I, I got, I had knee problems and uh, you can't lift heavy barbells with a bad knee. And unfortunately, my knee problems, uh, uh, I, I just solved them with my second knee replacement uh, seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need well, it. I, with I the need size it. of some of these wrestlers today, you're probably still stronger than a lot of them. I don't know. You see this? That's a 12 ounce Miller Lite. And I bet I can lift more of these than anybody in wrestling today. You know, that, that, that's, that's how I judge my strength nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> 12 sure. ounces at a time. <laughs> well, I'll, I would take you up on that challenge, but 
There's a fan on here that wants to know your thoughts on the Vince McMahon retirement and paying off all these women that he supposedly had sex with. Yeah, I, I'm so divorced from uh, the WWE. I didn't even know about it until, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago. And I, uh, God, I, I can't remember who I was talking to about it. As uh, one of the boys, I, I might have been Jerry Bris Briscoe uh, or JBL, one of those guys, or somebody else, I don't know. But it, they told me uh, about that when I asked them. I said, Vince, Vince McMahon didn't retire or get fired or laid off or whatever you want to call it. He's still calling the shots. They say, oh, yeah, we know that. <laughs> he owns the majority of the stock. What's like that? he owns this. He's the majority owner of the stock. So he still technically owns the company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much his uh, wife owns. I'm sure she uh, is a large stockholder, too. You know, she, she owned the company at one time. Yeah, you know, because Vince uh, put everything in her name. But, uh, you know, technically, I don't know how the legal system works that well, but he had complete control over talent. He was a talent advisor. In other words, he could fire you and he could hire you and what, what, what he could do whatever he wanted with you. You know, he had no say so. Yeah. What were your thoughts on the whole independent contractor classification of uh, WWE wrestlers, even though they pretty much have full control over you when you work for them? Well, that's another thing, you know, independent contractors. We weren't independent of shit. We, we went where we were told to go. Uh, we, uh, uh, we're, well, we were told uh, how to get to a venue. You know, we either drive or fly. Uh, we told uh, we were told where to go. Uh, you know, so I, we had no control over uh, uh, what was going on. You know, the the wrestling office dictated uh, what was going on, and we followed orders. Otherwise, you get fired. Yeah. Some someone on here is asking if you were around during that whole uh, Pat Patterson, Mel Phillips, Terry Garvin sex scandal, or if you ever noticed anything weird with those guys. Yeah, you know, I was there. I was right in the middle of it. I didn't even know what was going on. Yeah, can I, it just everything went right right under. Under the table, I didn't notice anything. <clears throat> and uh, I heard about it about a year, year or two later. And I, I said, what? Mel Phillips and Pat Patterson. Uh, I don't know. Was Vince involved in that? Um, no, but Pat Patterson had to retire briefly. And Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin were, I believe, released and never came back. Oh, well, yeah, I, I heard that. Uh, I heard that uh, Mel Phillips had complete control over the, up in the New England states, you know, from uh, New York all the way to, to Maine. And uh, so I, I guess uh, he was... Uh, doing whatever he wanted to and you know terry garvin and pat patterson were uh, asshole buddies so they they, they never uh, uh interjected or anything <laughs> what about steve labardi and pat patterson uh, a lot of kamala said he witnessed it uh there's a lot of talk about those but did you ever see anything unusual between those two mm. I heard that Pat Patterson hired 
uh, Steve uh, Lombardi. He was a Brooklyn brawler, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, and then uh, I hired him to do odd, oddball stuff, you know. And uh, I, I, I didn't see them do anything. You know, the right. more time you weren't hanging out around. with them either. You weren't going out for drinks with them after the matches, I'm sure. What's that? You weren't hanging out with them after the matches either, as you said. No, <laughs> hell, I went. I went with uh, what, whatever girl I had that night, you know. And uh, you know, it was funny. Back in those days, you pull up to the back of the arena, park your car. Yeah, because yeah, we, we drove almost everywhere, or we fly into a town and go rent a car, and uh, very rarely take a taxi cab anywhere. But anyway, uh, you pull up to the back of the arena, uh, where uh, you know all, all the workers uh, went in and the wrestlers and whatever. And shit, there'd be 50, 60 beautiful girls out there. And, uh, you know, the, the, you didn't have to pick one. They'd pick you. You know, Kenny, I want to be with you tonight. Or, you know, if I was already booked with some other chick, you know, that they'd find uh, a, a different wrestler. But that's how it was back then. Yeah, we didn't have to sweet talk any any uh, any girls. You know, they they didn't have to sweet talk us either. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Was there any particular town that had the best uh, groupies? Oh God. Yeah, the uh, Atlanta uh, territory, uh, which. Of course, uh, included Atlanta and a bunch of smaller towns in Georgia. Uh, I didn't work Florida territory, but I heard Florida was phenomenal. Um, California, of course, you know, the cesspool of America still is. Uh, Dallas, uh, Texas was good. Uh, Louisiana, the southern, all the southern states were good. And then you go up to the northern states and uh, Colorado was uh, good. You know, back in the day, all those girls looked gorgeous to me, you know, especially when they didn't have their clothes on. <laughs> so it's uh, just one of those things, you know. <laughs> yeah, things have, have changed over the years. There's a little less of that these days. Yeah, I heard that. I said, that's too bad. One of these girls, their mother must have told them, stay away from those wrestlers. Well, <laughs> the, res the wrestlers would rather just go back to their hotel and play video games. Really? Apparently, that's the big thing with wrestlers now. God. They go back and plug in their video games and have little competitions with each other. Yeah, I, I don't think I would get along. Yeah, I don't think I would fit in uh, the wrestling business anymore. <laughs> there, There's a fan here that says you're looking good. How come so many wrestlers your age have dementia and you seem to be all good? And also, he says, what Vince did to you after you left was just nasty. Could, could you repeat that? He says, you're looking good. How come so many wrestlers your age have dementia and you're all good? And he also says, what Vince did to you after you got out was just nasty. Well, I, I, I thought that I did have dementia. I you're telling me that I don't have dementia? I don't know. Who is this fan? I'd like to meet this character. I think he's just trying to uh, make me feel good. But uh, I don't. I think it's... Uh, they didn't drink enough Miller Lite and uh, enough uh, Bacardi rum. 
and uh, enough uh, Russian vodka. I think that's what their problem is, you know. Like uh, a guy like Jimmy Brunzel, you know, he he's, uh, eats his uh, Cracker Jacks and says his prayers, and but Je- you know, Jimmy's as sharp as a tack. He, he a little younger than me. I think Jimmy's seventy three. Looks like he's forty, and uh, you know he had uh, he's had as many replacement surgeries as me. You know he's had his knees and shoulders and uh, hips, and every time he has a hip replacement or knee, he calls me and he's pissed off all the time. I said, Jimmy. Why get pissed off? It happens. Your body wears out and you have to have a new joint stuck in there. You know, big deal. You know, I said, you're you're, you're not never going to wrestle again. Well, yeah, that's true. I said, "Uh, you're never going to be able to high jump seven feet anymore and throw eight foot drop kicks. Yeah, so, but a lot of a lot of guys bitch and complain. But I you know one like, guy that has dementia bad now, and a fan's bringing him up is Bob Backlund. I interviewed him uh, maybe three or four months ago. He he couldn't remember hardly anything. You know, Bobby called me. I was wondering. He used to call me at least once a month for twenty, thirty years. And then all of a sudden, about a year ago, uh, started to drop off. I let him call me because when I called him, I don't know. uh, I I was never able to get, you know, he he had his call screened by his uh, wife, I think, or his daughter or something. And so I just, you know, and, and I told Bobby, I said, Bobby, instead of me calling you, why don't you just call me? Because I answer my own phone. He says, yeah, that's fine. And then when he uh, uh, come through Minnesota, you know, he doesn't fly anywhere. He hasn't for 20 some years. He'd always swing uh, uh, through St. Paul. Well, shit, I'm going back 30 years. And he'd come in, into my, uh, my gym and um, I'd miss him half the time because he'd never call to find out if I was going to be working that day. Now, don't get the wrong idea. I went to work every fucking day, just like a red-blooded American, because I had to pay Uncle Sam. First, first check of every month that I wrote was to the government because I wanted to be an honest uh you know, citizen. I, I wasn't like these goddamn Democrats trying to get uh, around their tax uh, uh, obligations, you know. So, um, and of course, I don't work anymore. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know how much money they can get, me, get out of me anymore. They try, believe me. Oh, I'm sure. And I'm, yeah. it's probably worse in Canada, actually. But uh, this fan wants to know who is it easier to wrestle, Bob Backlund or Ivan Putsky? Oh, boy. That's a tough one. Um, when I wrestled Backlund, he was, you know, new to the business. Uh, in his early years, you know, and, uh, but I, I, he liked working with me. As a matter of fact, he still, whenever, before he got dementia, I guess, uh, he'd always call me and thank me uh, for uh, teaching him about the business, you know, and, but, and I did because I knew I had to work with the guy every fucking day for a year and a year and a half you know, back in the late 70s. And uh, so I, I didn't want to get beat up every fucking day. 
know, first time I worked with him, uh, it was in a little town um, in New Jersey. It was down on the Jersey Shore, and I think it was around August, like 110 degrees on the fucking beach. Uh, God, the hell's the name of that little town? Well, during the summer, it's like 2,500 people. Or during the winter, it's 2,500 people. During the summer, it's like 50,000. And uh, so we went down there, and they had just uh, built a, a new civic center that held about, I guess, about eight, 900 people. Uh, no windows in the place. And, uh, but at least it was clean. And it was right right next to the beach wildwood wildwood new jersey so we went down there and he you know we that was his first coming out match for the wwf and he was going to have one year of uh, matches before they put the belt on him he beat me up so fucking bad i had cauliflower ear a fat lip, a bloody nose, a swollen eye, and my he, he damn near uh, tore my fucking arm off. And we, <laughs> he was going a million miles an hour. And so we get back to the locker room. He comes over and saying, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. I, 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 what, what, what do you think of the match? I <coughs> I said, I've been trying to evaluate for the past five minutes. I think it was a shits, Bob. <laughs> he said, really? I said, you got to slow down. Slow down. He's going a million miles an hour. I said, I said when you go that fast, the, the fans can't get into it. Because you go from one thing to another, to another, to another, in rapid succession. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know you think that you're getting yourself over and showing the people how well you can wrestle, but that's not how the. You have to be visual. You have to show the people, and in order to show the people, you have to kind, of, kind of work in slow motion. That if you get that, you're not actually going in slow motion, but. You know, you have to feel like you're going in slow motion. So, uh, but I told him, we'll work it out. We're going to have a few matches, you know, coming up, you know, over the next four or five months. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, good, good. And I said, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know. And uh, he always remind me that uh, over the years, you know, that was in, 78, I think, 77, whatever it was. And so over the, the, the next 30, 40 years, he always thanked me. Kenny, if it wasn't for you, I would have never learned this business. I says, yeah, probably, because nobody else wanted to take the time to teach you. And he said, isn't that the truth? But I, I, somebody called me about six months ago and said, have you talked to back, Backlund lately? I said, yeah, but he didn't even know who in the fuck I was. That's what I was thinking. I said, because he always called me, so he, he always you know, re remembered to call me, you know, because he had my phone number. That was the deal that we had set up years ago. And... Uh, uh, he called and try, try to remember things, and he couldn't remember. And so then I'd, I'd ask him about somebody or some event that we had done in the past. Not a clue. And uh, then I was thinking, I, I wasn't going to ask him if he was suffering from, you know, uh, dementia or anything like that, you know, because, you know, he probably wouldn't even know. So, yeah. 
Yeah, his agent told me that basically it was now or never for the interview because it's not going to get any better. Yeah. Oh, you interviewed him? Yes, but um, it was it was tough. I also interviewed Paul Orndorff when he had dementia. And oh. It's not, uh, it isn't easy, but I, d I do believe I asked him about you, but all he could say was Ken was good. Like he couldn't remember uh, specifics or yeah. anything. So. Yeah, well, we were always good friends, you know. So same with uh, Paul Orndorff. God, it, uh, last time I saw Paul was in New York, I just felt sad. Uh, he, he looked like a little old man. He had a, all great um, sweats, uh, sweatpants and sweatshirt on. And he was sitting in the, in the restaurant in the corner all by himself. And he looked like a little old man all shriveled up. And I said, Jesus Christ, what the fuck? So I went over there. I said, Paul. And he kind of looked at me. He said, yeah. I said, Brad Reagan told me that I, if I see you over here in New York to say hi. Brad, he said, I don't know any Brad. Brad Reagan, Minnesota. No, I, I, I don't know any Brad. And uh, so when I got back to Minnesota, I called Brad and told him that uh, he didn't uh, recognize your name anymore. And uh, I, I said, when was the last time you saw Paul? I said, you guys used to go hunting every year. You'd go down to Georgia or he'd come up here to Minnesota. <clears throat> the big hunter, they like to do that. I, I've never been hunting in my life. Well, a pussy, you know, that's, I can't count. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm in the same uh, hunting uh, boat as you are. That's about all I've hunted as well. Yeah. <laughs> Richard wants to know uh, if you have an Andre the Giant drinking story. I'm sure you do. Sound, you seem like the type of guy Andre would have liked. Andre the Giant drinking story? Well, most of them take an hour to tell. I mean, you know, it's not like we used to drink, sit down and drink one or two beers. We sit down, he drank a hundred beers and I drank at least 40, you know, so that it takes time to tell Andre the Giant drinking stories. I think every Everybody that uh, can, you know, still follows. I think I think they've heard them all, um, or that. Well, you, you don't hear everything, but you know, Andre was a funny son of a bitch. He was funny, and uh, he liked to tell stories and. Yeah, he, he he was a funny guy. Yeah, but most people wouldn't know that, you know, because they, they don't think that a giant can be funny. But I he had me in stitches all the time. Didn't I hear that he would sometimes in Japan or even in America as a joke, like lay out newspapers on the bed and just take a massive dump for the uh, maids that he found that hilarious? Uh, Andre, Never. you mean? Yeah. No, he just fucking sit on the edge of the, the bathtub and shit in the tub. <laughs> no, oh sir. my god. He could he could barely get in the fuck. Well, if, if he was in some little uh, motel in southern or northern Japan where he couldn't even get in the bathroom, you know, I, I'm sure then he just shit the. Uh, 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 shit on the newspaper or something or just shit, shit on the coffee table or something. I mean, when the big guy has to take a dump, he takes a fucking dump. <laughs> I tell you, he, he clear, he, sometimes he would, I'll tell you a funny story. We're in Boston. I, I think this story might've been told a few times. We were in Boston. 
And uh, we'd always lock her in the same locker room as the Boston Celtics, you know, the uh, basketball team. They had two stalls. And, uh, or no. No, I think they only had one shitter. And it was right next to the fucking sink. In the old Boston Garden. What a shithole. Great place to have a wrestling show, though. Uh, I sold that place out with Bruno and uh, Backlund, um, I don't know, seven, eight times, ten times. How many times? You know, I, I don't remember. You know, whenever I was uh, the main event there, I was the main event there a lot. But anyway, uh, uh, Andre has to take a shit. This has turned into a fucking shit interview. I thought this was a shoot interview. <laughs> well, <laughs> the fans like hearing about that. It, it, anyway, that fucking Andre, it, you know, he could, the, the size of the uh, stall where the toilet was, was real tall because those basketball players, shit, they're seven feet tall. And so Andre would go in there and uh, take a dump, and of course, plug the fucking toilet up. And one time he was in there flushing that fucking toilet, I bet, 30 times. And I said, Andre, did that fucking turn ever go down? No, boss. <laughs> Anyway, the fucking, and the the bathroom was right between the two uh, locker rooms, and there were no doors or nothing, you know, it was just wide open. He stunk that fucking place up. So, oh man, it was bad. And before he took a dump, he farted. That <laughs> fucking fart had to be 40, 50 seconds long. It just rumble out of his, out of his head. <laughs> it was like an out, uh, outdoor motor or something, you know. Yeah, that was brutal. Yeah. <laughs> when he'd get, whenever us guys were laughing, he'd laugh right along with the show. It didn't offend him at all, you know. He was good about that, you know. After all, he's a goddamn giant. What the fuck are you gonna do? <laughs> exactly, and he was a top draw as well, so you couldn't. He had control. They always allowed him to drink, didn't they, in the dressing room? He was the one guy. Yeah, that... him, him and Lou Albano. You know, I, I, I never drank in the locker room. You know, I, 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 I didn't like uh, uh, wrestling drunk. You know, but you know, I did a couple of, there were a few exceptions. We were in uh, Las Vegas and we were supposed to wrestle at the Thomas Mack Center over at uh, UNLV. So we got in about 8 39 in the morning and uh so everybody's starving so we go in the the the, the i don't know if casinos have them anymore but the like lounge uh bars and uh what i mean by that you, you that they're right in the lobby right in the fucking lobby. And so before you go anywhere, uh, you could get a drink right there in the lobby. But of course, you know, they have tables and they had a big bar. And so we're at Caesar's Palace and they they had just re, redid the, the uh, uh, lounge uh, bar. It was beautiful. Yeah, we were all thirsty. I think there were seven or eight of us. So we'd go in there. We all, you know, take a seat and everything. And we, uh, 
uh, everybody orders whatever they want you know you know whether it be a, a hard liquor or a beer or whatever so anyway captain america dick murdoch dirty dick murdoch that merciless bastard he says let's have a drinking contest there it's a fucking nine o'clock in the morning <clears throat> and i said dick i said are you serious he says i think i can drink more beer than andre can i think that's my just, just turn that off Put that fucking phone in, in a goddamn drawer or something. But, <laughs> but anyway, Murdoch, uh, you know, we're all sitting down, relaxing. I bet I get Andre's at one end of the uh, circle there. So Murdoch stands up. Andre, I bet I can drink more beer in an hour than you can. And Andre looks at him. And the, the, the Murdoch, I don't know what the hell was wrong with him. He must have had a bunch of bennies in him or something. And so I says, well, I'll get in on this action. And uh, then uh, Dino Bravo did the same, Lou Albano. Uh, 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 Frank Valois, Andre's manager. Uh, he was 60 years old at the time. And uh, he was about 340 pounds, a big guy. But, you know, he's like 60 years old. So I didn't expect him to get in on the action. But he did. So anyway, to make a long story short, because this is a long story. Started at nine in the morning, and we didn't uh, have our last beer till seven thirty at night, and the matches started at eight. And so, <laughs> so it's quite obvious we weren't at we weren't at uh, uh, the arena yet. We were about fifteen minutes away. So, who in the fuck is calling? God damn. Is it your wife? Are you still married? No, no, I'm shit. I haven't been married for God. Well, I had three wives. I remember that. And uh, then uh, 1988. So that's what, 30, 34 years ago? Christ, 34 years ago was the last time I was married. But anyway, so we start drinking. And then the, the uh, manager of the uh, uh, special events, you know, he controlled the boxing matches and the car races, but whatever kind of special event that Caesars Palace did, he, this guy uh, handled everything. He was a young guy. He was like 30 years old, big wrestling fan. So he comes in the bar. <clears throat> he said, what's going on in here? I said, Dick Murdoch challenged Andre the Giant to a beer drinking contest and that were right in the middle of it. Oh, really? And I, I said, yeah. I said, uh, I think this is the main event situation. I think Caesar's Palace ought to pay for the beer. He says, I think so too. So he has the bartender get a bunch of these little plastic uh, uh, containers that people put their coins in when uh, they're playing uh, slot machines. I, I don't even know if they have those anymore. I, I mean, they still have slot machines, but everything's computerized now. So anyway, the bartender had these seven or eight uh, little uh, uh, buckets uh, behind the bar. Every time we order beer, he'd pop a bottle cap off and throw it in. What? 
That fucking phone? Is that my phone? What, 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 what? No peace, Hannibal, I'll tell you. But uh, anyway. I hope it's a ring rat. I hope it's one of the groupies that saw you at the convention today. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> what the hell would I do with her? You know, I have her stripped down and, and turn around circles. I said, that looks familiar, uh, lady. <laughs> I'm sure someone in there has a Cialis for you. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But 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 anyway, uh, after all those hours of drinking, I mean, we were all fucked up. <clears throat> and Frank Andre drank 117 beers. His manager Frank Valois drank like 70. 65 or 70 and here's guy 60 years old at the time and uh, i think i took third and i drank 46 44 46 something like that and big mouth uh captain america dick murdoch drank like 40 he was like 50 and uh, Lou Albano dropped out and went to v vodka. And uh, Dino Bravo drank quite a few. That Dino drank about 40. And uh, so I have like 7 o'clock at night, uh, the manager came in. And he says, well, he says, I can't count everybody's bucket up. And here's the list. I wrote everybody's name down. And. That, that that's how we knew, you know, who won and who drank what. So uh, uh, we get uh, uh, somebody said, oh, Arnie Skolan called. I said, well, you told him that we're on our way. No. I said, well, why not? So anyway, we get the van, the van from the casino, from Caesar's Palace, and we all pile in, and uh, uh, we get over to the arena. We pull up in the back. Nobody there. I said, "Shit, is anybody in here?" We go and uh, turn that fucking thing off. God damn. I don't know. The phone's over with the fans in the comment section. But uh, so what happens when you get to the show? Oh, so we get to the show. We walk in the back. And I, I didn't know if anybody was there. We go inside. There's 19,000 people in there. We go in the locker room. Arnie, Arnie Skolm says, okay, guys. Who's the, who's the wise guy that uh, pulled this bullshit off? I uh, says, well, it's Andre. And of course, Skoln was uh, running the show and he eventually wound up being uh, Andre's manager after Frank Belois uh, retired. <laughs> he said, don't pull, don't pull that shit on me. And he says, uh, the show's already started show it started five minutes before i said well we're all here now i said yeah you're all fucking drunk i says no we're just drunk we're not fucking drunk and he says god what the hell am i gonna do with you guys so anyway we're all we get our bags unpacked and everything he said patero you're working with the giant tonight i said yeah i know he said for TV, we need 15 minutes. I said, 15 minutes. Can we make it 10 or 12? No! I said, okay, okay. I said, well, talk to Andre. Uh, see what he has to say about it. I don't have to. Uh, I just tell Andre he'll do it. I said, okay. I said he drank over 100 beers. <laughs> what? 
I said, yeah, he drank over a hundred beers. I, I I didn't even drink half that many. I, I drank a little over 40. Holy fuck. I, he said, okay, do your best. And uh, because it was uh, televised, 19,000 people in the place. And uh, to give you an idea how well we did, we went out there the next month and it was sold out again. <laughs> Skolman says, God, you guys killed me. Yeah, so yeah, we, we, we had a fantastic match. We had wound up going 17 minutes. We didn't te- touch each other for the first 12. And uh, people wanted to kill me because, you know, I was a bad guy. But I like being the bad guy. So that's how it was back in the day. Yeah. Well, if anyone can look up that match, uh, send it to me. I'd like to see it. But I'm sure you guys uh, held yourselves together. As you said, you were on autopilot and you still came back and sold out again. Yeah. Yeah. It was just It was automatic. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you joining us again. The fans always love you. Hopefully uh, we can have you again down the road. Uh, you don't have any social media or anything where fans can contact you, do you? Do you? Well, I do, but, uh, you know, my, my website has been so fucked up. I can't even remember it right now. I, I haven't even used it in three, four months. Uh, months I think and uh, but what what I'll do when, when I get back to Minnesota I'll have my daughter uh, uh, send something to you and that, that that way you can put it up on the uh, internet or up on your show I guess yeah we could we could share it with the fans for sure yeah okay well, we appreciate you talking to us. I know some people are saying it's Ric Flair asking to borrow money for you. Other people are saying it's Vince uh, calling you. Everyone wants to know who that person is. So, what, what What's that now? Like some people think it's Ric Flair wanting to borrow money for you, for you from you on the phone. Oh, on the phone. <laughs> hey, you never know. You know, I, I'd, I'd take that as a compliment, but I, I'd have to uh, inform Rick. I said, I'm a retired wrestler from the WWE. I'm fucking broke and bankrupt. <laughs> I said, uh, could, could you uh, run a, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, GoFundMe. A, a GoFundMe page. <laughs> Yeah, you've never had to stoop to those levels, thank God. You seem no. like one of the normal ones. Yeah, I, I, well, not that, you know, I was never a multimillionaire, you know. But back in the day, we didn't make that kind of money. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, I had a good gym business, and uh, then, uh, uh, when I turned 58, I got a job offer uh, that I really couldn't refuse. So um, I worked for a company It was called Twin City Wire. It was an industrial wire uh, company in uh, Minnesota there. And uh, I did uh, outdoor sales. They bought me a $50,000 pickup truck back in uh, uh, 88. Was it eight? No, 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 no. In 2002. 2002. I drive around the state of Minnesota selling uh, wire to uh, wire screens to, uh, that way we sold crushers, you know, the big machines that crush rock for highway uh, construction projects and whatnot. it was a pretty technical job, really, but it sounds crazy, you know. You, you, you crush the rocks and then you uh, uh, put them through uh, this uh, screening process. 
But anyway. Answer that phone and find out who the hell it is. Yeah, it's Mark Henry. Uh, this joker says maybe it's Mark Henry. <laughs> I said, we'll, we'll end the interview with finding out who that person is. I'm curious. Let's find out. Hey, what's your yeah. passcode? Hold on, what's your passcode? <laughs> what's your passcode? Let's fucking find out who this fucking person is. Here. Hold on, what's the passcode? You're doing. Yeah, give it to Ken. Let's see. The fuck? Passcode 69. Six, yeah, give out their number for everybody. Here, oh, let's call that yeah. motherfucker. Let's see who it is. This is crazy. Well, I'm sure, yeah, come on. Get him figured out. Oh, well, look, look at that. No caller, no caller. Well, let's call out. It was some fucking asshole. This is bullshit. Let's see, let's see if we get a call. Dude, you guys it's almost call. midnight. Seven of these days, no call. You. you can't even fucking call this shit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Hannibal. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> we'll let you. Uh, we'll let you close this off with whatever you want to say to the fans. But thanks again, and I hope to uh, have you on again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I thought after the first two times you were never going to talk to me again. You know, because I said fuck uh, two or three times and I had quite a few beers and, uh, you know, all that good stuff, I think. You know, I don't fuck. The more beer I drink, the better I sound. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please help me out and like this video, then click the subscribe and get notifications button.